will the restaurant industry do in 2024? Hello, this is Jonathan Mays, Editor-in-Chief of Restaurant Business. And in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with Hudson Reilly, the Senior Vice President of the Research and Knowledge Group with the National Restaurant Association. Hudson is a regular guest on the podcast, and I had him on this week to chat about the association's State of the Industry report, which it released earlier this month. We talk about how big the restaurant business really is. Restaurants and bars are expected to generate $1.1 trillion in sales this year, crossing the trillion mark for the first time ever. We chat about how big the industry is and how many people it employs and the economic impact restaurants have. We talk extensively about labor, labor costs, labor availability, and efficiency. We talk also about demands for technology among operators, which is related to all that labor cost, and why it's important for restaurants to target younger generations these days. It's all in the numbers. It is a packed podcast on a deeper dive this week, so please check it out. Here with Hudson Reilly. Hudson, welcome to the podcast. Well, good day, Jonathan. Glad to be joining again. All right, awesome. So uh, finally hit the trillion mark this year, or at least that's what you think, huh? Yep. And, uh, you know, it, it's such a staggering amount, uh, $1.1 trillion. Uh, So we thought about it, you know, how do you put it in perspective? And just in a single day, that average is out to over $3 billion. And if you break it down hourly, it's about $120 million every hour, 366, 24 7 this year. So it, it uh, is directionally correct, but uh, make no mistake about it. 2024 economically is a year of moderation compared to 2023. So you can look at all the macroeconomic indicators, real GDP, income, employment. Income, it's it's all still a positive environment, but it is a year that the growth rates uh, are moderating. So consequently, industry sales reflect that underlying macroeconomic climate. And as a result of that, you know, sales this year will be up over 5%. Uh, but the fact is, uh, compared to particularly pre-pandemic growth rates, uh, it, it certainly is an environment that that while positive is cautiously optimistic, I would say. Really? So, okay. So 5% sales growth this year, which I think in the scheme in, you know, in, in, in the, the broad scheme of things actually is pretty moderate given you, you got to factor in probably what one to 2% unit growth uh, somewhere along the lines, but then you got prices. And right. so, you know, that's the typical thing where people are, are going to be spending more, but their actual visit rate per restaurant certainly isn't going to be up. Um, and it, it still yeah. suggests an industry that's going to be fighting for market share. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the association has done a weekly uh, consumer tracking study, uh, both on and off premises across the three different meal periods. And uh, here we are four years later, and the on-site traffic across all three meal periods is still down compared to pre-pandemic. And conversely, if you look at that off-premises, and we include in that takeout, delivery, drive-through, curbside, if you look at, at that across all three meal periods, uh, the traffic levels are up four years later. So, you know, COVID changed the world, and uh, it certainly changed the restaurant industry. And those ripple effects still continue to this day well into 2024. But it is a positive operating environment. And, you know, last year and this year will be probably the most, quote, normal operating environment for the industry since 2019. But there are hosts of other underlying economic trends, demographic trends, uh, consumer trends. Uh, which indicate that while positive, it, it, it is a year of moderation. And uh, all you have to do is travel around to all these different city center areas to realize uh, that the remigration of those critical you know, city center office workers, while it is getting better than it was a couple of years ago, it is a situation that is far from normal. And uh, those city center office workers, you figure even with that hybrid model, 
if they come in three, maybe four days a week, uh, for that business week, you're looking at anywhere from a, a pool of reduction of 20 to 40% uh, what it was pre-pandemic. And so obviously from the industry overall, uh, there is what we call some redistributive effect in that, uh, you know, some of those meals are displaced out to the more suburban rural locations. Um, but in these city center areas, perhaps one of the most challenging aspects of this for the operators that are that are still viable and, and uh, working in these city center areas is the extreme variability by day a week now. Hmm. And so as, as you would, it makes perfect sense if you think about it, you Tuesday is the highest traffic day for office workers coming into these city center areas. Friday is, is uh, you know, common sense wise, the, the lowest level. But if you look at the, uh, in essence, participation rates of these employees in these city center areas, by those two different days a week, uh, it can be wide, wide variations, in some cases exceeding 100%. So, for example, Texas actually at the moment has the highest uh, return to office rates. and in there, even in that city, you can have the, the, the daily rates range between, you know, 70 down into the 30 percent range. And so as an operator where, you know, you used to be able to depend it on five business days, the ability to have such a flexible operation to deal with that wide disparity in that potential pool in that marketing area is is unprecedented. And these guys have really been innovative, I think, in, in terms of, of how they're dealing with this. Obviously, there's been a lot of menu re-engineering. The, the, the workforce has to be more flexible than ever. In many cases, uh, that real estate component, those occupancy costs uh, might have been renegotiated. Uh, in some cases, obviously not renegotiated. But this still has years to play out in terms of how these city centers in that commercial real estate market respond. Mm -hmm. So let me, um, let me throw out uh, some numbers from the report, $1.1 trillion total sales, 1 million plus outlets. Uh, I assume you mean generally restaurants, but I'm going to get to that question in a minute. And then 15.7 million employees. I mean, Hey, the one thing that stands out to me always is, you know, the industry is, is a lot larger then I think people really appreciate it is uh, it is a massive employer. Um, and I think your numbers, you know, show that at one out of three Americans at one point in their lives worked at a restaurant. McDonald's, by the way, will tell you that one in eight of Americans, right. which is mind blowing. And I'm one of them. Yeah. One of eight Americans had spent time working for the Golden Arches. So it's a big industry. I mean, it is a it's a large and massive employer and and economic generator, which I think people don't quite appreciate. Exactly. I mean, currently it's it's roughly one out of every ten Americans working actually works directly in the restaurant industry. Uh, the restaurant industry is the nation's second largest private sector employer, and within the hospitality industry, currently. Uh, even four years after the pandemic, there's there's still roughly about 900,000 openings just in the hospitality industry. So, uh, you know, when we survey restaurant operators, not surprisingly, their current challenge remains labor recruitment. And, you know, it is better than it was two years ago, that's for sure. Uh, but in terms of their ability to not only recruit labor at these substantially higher uh, price points, but the availability. And now you throw in this irregularity of customer patronage patterns. Profitability does remain under pressure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we survey restaurant operators about their thoughts about profitability. And it, it really is surprising the high numbers, uh, that re that indicate between the labor cost pressures and you know you can look at labor cost pre pandemic and and during the pandemic and where we currently are uh 
you know, these three year periods, if, if, you know, 24, 23, 22, and this is based on, uh, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, those average hourly earnings are at record high annualized rates three years in a row. So it, it is a, I mean, the labor costs are coming down. Uh, but the fact is, it's like uh, food costs, once they go up, there may be a little disinflation, but it's certainly not deflation. And so uh, with those input costs, uh, it, it, it is a, a challenge for operators across the country to remain a viable ongoing business concern in, the, in this tight profitability situation. And, you know, the typical annualized sales volume of a restaurant in America today is just a million dollars. And so if you think about that, you know, it comes out to an average of just about $2,700 a day. Hmm. And then if you break that down further, you know, say a uh, small independent can get a pre-tax profit margin of, of 5%. You're you're talking between just a you know roughly a couple hundred dollars of pre-tax profit per day, so you know it's an extremely fragile situation, and that, and that's why you're seeing new business models and uh, uh, real estate pad sites changing because uh, that that traditional model in this environment of such sustained menu price inflation and labor price inflation uh, it. It's one thing, I mean, if you think about gas prices and how that's always applied pressure on the industry and the increases in that, in that situation, it's not only the price level, but how long it remains at that price level. And in, in general, you know, particularly now, you've seen gas prices come down over the past year. So that's, that's <laughs> a plus. But looking at the levels that the labor costs are now at and the duration of this, uh, it it fundamentally changes how labor has during the pandemic and will continue to be uh, differently deployed uh, in a typical restaurant operation. And, and as you well know, that's one of the reasons that the technology focus is front and center now, because with such a labor intensive industry, <laughs> you can look at sales per employee in the industry and they are just, it's just $83,000 a year, roughly. And so uh, other retail businesses overall have about 460000 per employee. And they're capital intensive industries that have, you know, several million dollars a year per employee sales. So the industry has always been extremely labor intensive. Uh, but the fact is, particularly for off premises and to some degree on site, there still is a lot of productivity and efficiency gains, which can materialize. But the challenge is, particularly for smaller operators, is the not only the initial upfront investment, although the economies of scale are, are getting better, but it is a situation where, particularly among younger consumers, their expectation is that that restaurant experience incorporates some aspect of technology. And uh, so going forward, you know, when we survey restaurant operators, we ask them, uh, are they, what are they investing in, in currently regarding technology? What do they expect to do this upcoming year? And the, the fact is, is that they are stepping up their, their tech investments, um, but it varies substantially, as you would expect, not only by type of operation, uh, but even in terms of of a lot of the geographies which have different labor market conditions. And, uh, you know, that's another thing that uh, as, as the years have ticked past, uh, the variability in the local economies uh, is substantial now. And, and uh, in, in essence, you know, we always say uh, the best trading areas end up be the ones that have the higher population growth rates. And, you know, allied with that is the higher employment growth rates. And as a consequence of that, you get higher income growth rates, and then that translates into higher restaurant sales growth rates. And so that that remains a very fundamental axiom of you know success long term. And uh, you know that old saying, "Demographics is destiny," is is so true now because there's still, amazingly enough, over two dozen states 
that still have fewer restaurant employees in them than they did pre-pandemic. And, you know, it's just recently in, in the past couple of months that overall restaurant industry employment has actually reached where it was roughly pre-pandemic. Uh, but there's a host of, of uh, variances behind that top line number. So, for example, if you look at uh, table service restaurant employment, it's still down. Four years later, almost 250,000 employees. And conversely, if you look at quick service uh, employment, it's up by roughly almost that same amount. And another interesting development as an aside is that employment in, in bars and taverns has gone up too. So huh. during the pandemic, we, we, we think that traces back to the focus on the neighborhood uh, establishments where you didn't have to transit far to, to uh, go out. And so uh, it, it is structurally a, a different industry overall. And within these different segments, there are fundamental differences in terms of how that path to success is achieved. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, <laughs> this is interesting. Like, uh, I think we all were drinking heavily during the pandemic, but, um, no, uh, which tended to make things uh, go a little bit. Well, like you, you mentioned, you know this this issue of 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 efficiency in 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 the restaurant space, and actually, probably one of the more positive elements of the past few years is that the industry has actually done a really good job, um, you know, so a really good job of getting more efficient over really, if you look since the pandemic, um, where. Uh, the sales per um, employee in in the business has gone up um, uh, well above you know the the rates of of either grocers or or, or convenience stores, and you know, so your typical restaurant today is much more efficient than it was before the pandemic. Um, it still has obviously a ways to go because the only way this industry is going to be able to combat this labor issue is by getting more efficient um over the next you know over the next few years now it's never going to be that efficient especially full service restaurants still require a hefty right. labor component and you know and that's you know still going to be a really important issue going forward for them but you know this industry still needs to find ways to get, you know, more efficient because I don't see the supply of labor dramatically improving anytime soon. Uh, no, it, it's it's an interesting question when you think about how technology going forward uh, is deployed and what types of technology and what the consumer wants. And, you know, one of the things that the association research showed during uh, this last research initiative is the dramatic, dramatic differences by age cohorts regarding their expectations of usage of technology in restaurants, uh, as as well as how they think technology helps them in these different dining occasions. And uh, you know, we've always said the restaurant dining is is an occasion based decision and. Your decision matrix is entirely different. Uh, for example, you know, today for a convenient lunch at your desk than it is on a Friday or Saturday night where you're socialization focused. So the, the the sense is, you know, prior to the pandemic, the technology integration uh, proportionately was higher in quick service. And, uh, you know, table service has really stepped up their game. But the fact is, with you know, seventy-five percent of all restaurant traffic is off-premises now, and those are mainly convenience-based decisions. So there's still a lot of efficiency that can ultimately be gained in those those off-premise occasions, and even the socialization occasions, which skew towards table service. Uh, you know, if you look at digital ordering, uh, you know, pre-pandemic. You know, roughly just three percent of table service orders were digital. During the depths of the pandemic, that ratcheted up into the double digits, and you know it's currently roughly about one out of ten. At full service is digital now, so while proportionately it is much lower than quick service, a table service 
as a result of focusing on that technology integration, has really stepped up their game in terms of, of the enableization of technologies across that restaurant experience. Mm-hmm. So um, just for what it's worth, uh, you know, we're looking at the um, state of the industry report, 98% of, of, um, uh, of operators you surveyed said that labor costs were a challenge last year. And 98% said inflation and 97% said food costs. Uh, that's actually pretty insane um, to me. Uh, I mean, that's, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, you can't get 98% of people to agree on anything. No, uh, and no, for 98% can't. to say those, that's insane. It, it, it really is. And if you think about it, uh, I mean, let's take menu price inflation first. You know, in 2023, it was about 7.1%, 2022, 7.7%. And, you know, that those are the highest uh, annualized menu inflation rates uh, since 1981. In other words, coming out of that high inflationary period of the late 70s. Uh, so you're really talking, you know, 40 years since menu price inflation has had been in this, this uh, high level. And you know, this year we're looking for it to come down, uh, and it's going to be better than than uh, obviously the past couple of years. But still, uh, when you look at the labor situation and and the wholesale food price situation, particularly for some menu themes, that pressure is going to remain, just not at that elevated growth rate. Um, you can look at wholesale food price inflation, and uh, you know, 2022, 14.7% in wholesale food price inflation. That was the highest since 1974. So, you know, this is unprecedented territory considering how the industry has operationally changed uh, over, over that past almost half century. And uh, as we talked about earlier, that labor cost inflation situation is, is dramatic as well. So, it, it's it's also interesting to note too what what we're hearing in some of these city center le- areas regarding occupancy costs because you know occupancy costs are obviously another critical line item in terms of how ultimately the business can survive viable going on forward and in in some of these city center areas where there's this largesse of of commercial real estate open uh, some of these landlords are actually you know working with these operators to keep them in place and manage uh, those occupancy costs better considering the environment. And, you know, some, some refuse to go along. Uh, but once again, it's, it's another area. If you look at uh, the fluidity and flexibility of operators to deal with all of these, uh, what were once considered uh, extenuating circumstances, which has now become mainstream, and uh, it it is a testament to the industry's resiliency and innovation that you know here it is four years later, and the overall sales volume, uh, particularly in the past couple of years, is is uh, done okay. And uh, in the end, though, the operator community responds to what's going on with the consumer and. Particularly these younger age cohorts, in other words, the Gen Zs and the Millennials, attach a higher level of necessity to restaurant food spending than do the older age cohorts. So fortunately from the industry, in terms of how the consumer allocates their dollar, you know, and just half of consumer, all consumer spending goes to housing and transportation right off the top. So uh, the industry is fortunate that uh, people want to use it, particularly these younger age cohorts now. And so over the past few years, they have acted to preserve that spending uh, compared to other, other potential spending buckets. So, you know, looking ahead longer term, the next decade, decade plus, I, I think there's no doubt that consumers continue to shift Proportionally, uh, the restaurant component of spending on food in America. So 
you know, if you go back 1955, just 25% of all spending on food in America was rest for restaurants. Uh, and so even after, you know, this black swan event of the pandemic, that proportion, even with menu price inflation now, is running above 50%. So, you know, you look out over the next 5, 10, 15 years, and particularly as these younger age cohorts uh, get into their higher earning income brackets, it does bode well uh, for the industry to benefit from that sustained shift of spending, shifting the spending from at home to away from home. Mm -hmm. Real quick, I wanted to real quick bring uh, this one up because we talked a little bit about technology and the, the difference in viewpoints on technology between generation and yeah. between sector is very significant. So um, on quick service technology, for instance, uh, overall 39% of, of adults, according to your survey, had a po you know, says that tech in the quick service se sector has a positive impact. You know, and then your young kids, your your Gen Zers and Millennials, it's fifty three and fifty seven percent respectively. But then you get up to the baby boomers, and uh, they hate technology, and it's only sixteen percent. Whereas right. a percentage of people that say it's have a negative impact, um, you know, again dramatically increases. And then you get to you get to the baby boomers, and a fair number of people are like, it hasn't that says that technology has a negative impact on their willingness to go to a restaurant. Now, I'll tell you, my perspective on quick service is that, you know, I still think over time the quick service industry is probably moving pretty dramatically over on the tech spend. And I think that if we're looking at the restaurant industry, by the way, in 10 to 15 years, we're probably looking at a very, very different way of the business completely operating. Back of the house, front of the house, everything else. The idea of you going into a restaurant and seeing uh, more robots and more AI and all that other stuff is is coming. It's going to take some time because of the cost involved. But that said, I mean, that, there's a pretty big generational divide in technology. And, you know, if you want younger consumers, they kind of expect it. Yeah, and, it, it, it is it is dramatic when you look at those different age cohorts and their attitudes. And it, it in some ways, it is stereotypical. Uh, but when we talk to operators, uh, because essentially, you know, good business decisions are based on good data. And we emphasize how important it is, one, that they know the customer demographics at the, the current point in time. And more importantly, two, where they want to be three, five, seven years from now. Uh, because obviously... You know, one one great thing about the restaurant industry, which you know, is is that it is so fragmented and so large that you can still have segments and operations that you step into that it's like stepping back three, four decades in terms of the menu, in terms of the decor, and it, it doesn't mean those those segments and operations immediately disappear. It just means that those aren't where the highest growth rates uh, are going to occur. And, and so this idea of, of you know, if, if you don't know where you are, any road will take you there. The, the fact is, is that planning an operation for the future and doing a business plan and knowing that target demographic and then operationally aligning around that demographic in terms of investment and, and uh, uh concepting menu design it it really uh is the the strategic imperative of treating it like a business now is substantially more important than it was 40 years ago because the industry is so large the competition we you know we always ask about competition in the industry and uh you know this year operators still expect to have substantial substantial competition I and mean, even during the depths of the pandemic, it, it was competitive. Uh, but the fact is, is the economy's normalized. The competitive uh, aspects within the industry, uh, as well as outside the industry, come into play more. So you you can look at at uh, 
a typical restaurant operation and uh, extrapolate going forward against the demographics. And, uh, you know, this is the first time, if you look at the number of Gen Zers and millennials and compare them to the Gen Xers and baby boomers, there are now roughly almost 8 million more Gen Xers and millennials than there are uh, the older cohorts. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean as an operator, you, you need to be all things to all people. But you do need to be fairly well aligned with whatever you want your target demographic to be, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to, uh, yeah, you got to play to the kids, sir. This was great. Really appreciate you joining me again this on on the podcast. Okay, Jonathan. Anytime. We appreciate the opportunity as well. Thank you. And that should do it for this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, which was edited, as always, by Spoons. Artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. And you may subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.